Second, let's create a right market environment that enables innovation to thrive. One immediate opportunity that exists right now is strengthening the federal research and development tax credit by making it permanent and raising it to levels that make it globally competitive. One of the things that business hates the most and should is uncertainty. I used to be in Congress and I can tell you, you know, we, we really botched this up in my view. And for a lot of different reasons, you know, we got the Budget Act and we're worried about the deficit, so we never want to make anything permanent because then it gets scored for 10 years. And so we keep reenacting. Right now, Congress last night failed to reenact what we call the tax extenders. Now, everybody knows they've got to get reenacted, but we go through this long drama where we're trying to find the votes to reenact the R&D tax credit. Well, what is that? And that drama, you know, says to executives who have to make these decisions, maybe you shouldn't put that money into R&D. That tax credit may be taken away and they may pull the rug out from under you. So the uncertainty of this is really harmful. And so we're recommending a lot of good tax credits, but if we're going to deal with medical innovation, we've got to make this tax credit permanent and it needs to be raised. Third, we must enhance regulatory sciences efforts at the Food and Drug Administration by funding a collaborative effort to implement a science-based benefit-risk framework guided by government, patient advocates, and industry. This is critical to bringing both the best science and the best ideas forward as the FDA reviews and approves biomedical innovations. Now, we've already gotten the industry to pay for a lot of what FDA does. And that was undoubtedly important and necessary as government had less and less money. Let me tell you something. If we don't adequately fund FDA improve the regulatory science and have smart, able people doing this at the FDA, and that's hard to do too, we are not going to have the medical innovation that we need in this country. This is a bottleneck. It is a problem that only the government can solve, and the federal government needs to solve this problem, and we're going to be banging on the door at FDA and NIH to get these changes to be made. And I think the new head of the FDA, who I've met with on a number of occasions, the new head of the NIH, are going to be proponents with us in trying to get this done. Finally, it's incumbent upon our nation to do everything in our power to ensure that we're cultivating the next generation of researchers and scientists. You remember the space program? When I was a kid, you know, we were watching the astronauts, and everybody in my school wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> I even thought about it for a while, but quickly decided I could never make it because I was not too good at math. <laughs> uh, but it was cool to be a scientist. I'm on the board of Ford Motor Company, and we have a new executive there who came from Boeing, Alan Mulally. He's one of the best CEOs I've ever met. In fact, I helped get him to go from Boeing to Ford, and he's doing a crackerjack job. And when I first met him, I said, Alan, how did you get into the airplane business? And he said, well, he grew up in Wichita, Kansas, and when he was a kid, he saw the space program, and he wanted to be an astronaut. And so he went to the University of Kansas and studied science and math and engineering, and he was going to be an astronaut. And then, you know, one reason or another, he couldn't make it, but he wound up at MIT, and he continued his work in engineering, and he winds up out at Boeing, and he was at Boeing for 30 years. He did the 777 program. He's just a fabulous engineer and, and executive. And I thought to myself, he probably wouldn't have gone into science if it hadn't been for the space program. Too often today, kids, I think, look at the world and, you know, it's cool to be a football player, or it's cool to be a basketball player, or it's cool to be a rock star, or go to Hollywood, you know, whatever. It's not too cool to be a scientist. 
We need to solve that. We need to get our scientists, some of whom probably work in your company and maybe other organizations here, to be in front of kids. I had the chance a few years ago to go out to University of California, San Francisco, and talk to eight young researchers that were working on Alzheimer's disease. And I listened to the work they had done. One guy had been working on one part of the Alzheimer's puzzle for 20 years. And these folks don't make a lot of money. They make an adequate living. They don't make a lot of money. But they love what they do. And the payoff, the reward, is feeling like someday I'm going to make a breakthrough against something like Alzheimer's. I got to tell you, when I heard their stories, I had tears in my eyes at the dedication, at the excitement, at the passion with which they went at their science. We need those kind of people in front of our young people and showing them that science and medical innovation and doing this kind of work is really the most rewarding and exciting thing that you could ever do. So, we want more money uh, in biosciences, K through 12 science education, the STEM education efforts that the governor talked about. He really does get all of this. He's, he really gets it. And when I heard that you were the top state in the race to the top that Arnie and the president have put together, that's fantastic. That's what we need. We need every state to be competing for those race to the top awards and especially in science and math. <clears throat> so that's our agenda. That's what we're about. That's what we're going to be talking to people all over the country about. We're going to try to enlist the governors. I'm going to try to come to one of your governor meetings and talk about this agenda. We're going to try to get state legislators interested in it, try to get city councils, mayors. I was schooled by Tip O'Neill. I know that all of politics is local. <laughs> I get it. And we're going to try to build a groundswell in this country for medical innovation. I want to end with my personal story. The governor uh, told his story very well, and, and I guess everybody has a story. Uh, the reason I'm interested in this, in, in part, is that uh, we have three children, grown now. Our first, named Matt, born in 1970, and uh, when he was 18 months old, he got a, a diagnosis of a huge tumor on his prostate, which was very rare for a child that age. And in fact, when they finally diagnosed it after a lot of misdiagnosis, the doctor said, he has six weeks to live. There's no way we can deal with this. It's a huge tumor. It's invaded his entire abdominal cavity, and it, he, there's just nothing we can do. It shut down all of his systems. Long story short, uh, we, we happened to find uh, at Washington U, they found bound compu computers are a little different then than they are now. This is 1972, so what you carry around in your pocket would fill this room. Uh, but they found a triple drug therapy, and uh, they decided to use radiation in combination. Almost was toxic for him. In fact, when they started, they said, we probably shouldn't even do this because it isn't going to work, and the collateral damage is just going to be horrific. So if you want us to do it, we'll do it, but we don't give you any hope. Matt's 40 now. Um, he works with me every day in my business. <laughs> Nothing you can tell me about medicine. Nothing. Every time I see him, I get warm all over. He shouldn't be here. He's here. Because of this agenda, which has played such an important role in this country in all of our lives, this is an important agenda, and we must do everything we can to see that we advance it, we improve it, and we reach for the stars in curing the diseases that beset every one of us. Thank you.